Chapter 6, Depression Depression is the feeling of being bue, unhappy, melancholy, down in the dumps, like guilt, depression occurs when anger is trapped and turned inward. In this case, the anger becomes hatred and begins to rob life of its meaning. It takes energy to make one's world a livable place, and the depressed person has little energy to invest. Obviously when a depressed person and a happy person look at the same autumn landscape they are reacting to the same external world. Assuming that their senses are intact, the sensory impressions they receive are largely the same. Yet there is a great difference in the world each finally experiences. The happy person looks at the landscape and sees in it a reflection of his good feelings. The depressed person finds only additional reasons for being depressed as he calls to mind people now absent, his inner emptiness, his worthlessness, and worst of all, the contrast between his inner sadness and the brilliant world around him. Our moods color our world and shape our reality. In depression, energy seems turned against the self. Rather than allow his feelings to flow naturally, the depressed person regards each angry feeling as proof of his worthlessness and recoils from expressing any anger. Even so, he often appears angry as his overwhelmed defenses let bits of anger leak out here and there. Although depressed people often feel sad, depression differs from sadness. Sadness is the feeling of depletion that follows a hurt or a loss. When people feel sad and ask themselves, what have I lost, or how have I been hurt, they can usually come up with an answer that makes sense. They can express their anger over their hurt and pain from their loss. Their anger hasn't been buried, and if the hurt is set straight, their sadness usually disappears. When people are sad for a long time, without understanding what their sadness means, they often lose touch with the event that caused the sadness. Depression is the result. Their sadness just stays there, fed by a deep reservoir of anger and hatred. They feel worthless. Depressed people are always struggling to hold back their anger, and this very act of holding back depletes them further and can make them feel sick. Even though sadness and depression may sometimes feel the same at a given moment, they are not. The sadness of everyday life dissipates. The sadness in depression, on the other hand, is trapped. Left alone, it grows. Ordinary sadness passes with changes in fortune. Depression does not. Sadness is a passing phase in the natural flow of feelings. Depression is a disruption of the flow of feelings. To understand a particular depression you need to know the real feelings involved. Does the sadness seem reasonable compared to what's been lost, or is it blown out of proportion? If the depressive feelings fit the loss, you can often set yourself straight by identifying the loss, releasing the anger, and making appropriate amends when necessary. This is straightforward depression, the kind that responds well to talking out with friends or simply sitting down and quietly putting your feelings together with the events that caused them. Unfortunately most depression isn't so clear-cut. Pointing out the events that caused the original hurt is seldom enough to reverse a severe depression. When you turn anger against yourself, self-hatred builds out of proportion to reality, causing you to be defensively secretive. Such guardedness isn't always totally bad, it's a sign that a person at least recognizes that there's something wrong and may be able to take steps to correct it. Such depressed people often appear to improve in silence. In concealing their thoughts from you they also guard the progress of their recovery, their defensiveness often makes them inaccessible to words. Severely depressed people can sometimes be reached by working with their guilt feelings, since guilt is often the most accessible of their feelings. In a hospital experiment, a number of depressed patients were sent to occupational therapy eight hours a day, five days a week. Each patient was given a large bowl containing several thousand tiny colored beads, some smaller bowls and a pair of tweezers. 
The patients were instructed to sort the beads by color and place them in the smaller bowls. It was extremely tedious and could not be completed in a single day. At the end of each day, however, the occupational therapist would examine each patient's work, dump the carefully sorted beads back into the larger bowl, and tell the patient to come back and tackle the job again the next day. Since these patients were not communicative and couldn't be reached by the usual methods of psychotherapy, nothing about the patient's problems was ever discussed. Nonetheless they showed a marked improvement. The method apparently worked because in some way these patients felt they were being punished for their wrongdoing and were being allowed to make restitution for their evil ways. They were given an opportunity to work off their feelings of guilt by turning their anger away from themselves and directing it at a safe target. In the process their depression gradually lifted. The need for punishment in depression at least the chance to undo the harm that some depressed people believe they've done to others, seems an important part of the cure. Often when severely depressed patients start to get better they voluntarily take on such menial jobs as scrubbing latrines and floors. This sort of behavior, in or out of a hospital, seems to provide a working combination of self-punishment and directing anger and energy in an acceptable way outward both at the same time. In fact, directing energy outward is the first step in breaking the self-perpetuating cycle of depression. A person who feels depressed may have little inclination to get out and just do something. It takes an enormous amount of energy to be depressed. The best start may be solitary activities such as drawing, sewing, gardening, do-it-yourself repairing, cleaning cellars and attics and closets. All these offer a channel outside oneself without the pressure of socializing. Sometimes reconstructing a diary is helpful to sort out the events that have led to the present difficulty. Also helpful is to make a schedule of daily activities and trying to stick with it so that each day has a chance to provide something positive and rewarding. You don't have to be on top of the world to manage routine chores, and they may help you get off the bottom. Everyone has had feelings of sadness, and most of us have felt depressed at one time or another in our lives. To be depressed is to feel lifeless, inhibited and drained. Bodily functions are slowed down. Depressed people frequently develop constipation and have sleep disturbances. They characteristically wake early in the morning and can't go back to sleep again. They also find falling asleep difficult and are restless and easily awakened. What sleep they do get is not refreshing. Disturbing dreams in which trapped feelings seek expression often interrupt their sleep. The depressed person appears harried, worried, desperate to contain his anger and self-hate. To tolerate this state for long is exhausting. Defenses wear down and in the worst cases energy stops flowing outward at all. When people feel helpless to contain their rage and believe that things won't improve, they may turn their anger against themselves in one final attempt to end their pain either as a cry for help or as a real attempt to end their life. But a depression isn't always without its positive side. Even though a depression is painful to endure, it also can lower defenses that have been too rigid or too obscuring and permit a person a clearer, less distorted view of himself. During a depression people frequently begin to understand themselves for the first time and may be put in touch with other self-revealing feelings. In depression a person has a sense of having lost something very important that he was previously unaware of. He may feel that he has lost so much already that he has nothing more to lose by being honest with himself and re-examining what he thinks is important in his life. A depression, if accompanied by this kind of new awareness, may be the turning point for someone who previously has been poorly organized and not able to find direction. The collapse of the defenses can help a person to reshape his life, to find the courage to challenge what he thought was so important before, if what I had was supposed to be so important to me, why wasn't I happy? He may realize there is still time to change. Many people finally stop taking life for granted after overcoming a depression. 
Becoming depressed is hardly recommended as the ideal way for finding out what you're really like, but to ignore the realities about yourself that are revealed when your defenses are down is to miss a valuable opportunity to grow. Worse, the old anger over loss stays trapped, unsolved, and all your suffering has been for nothing. There is, after all, no inherent virtue in pain. It needs to be used. Unsolved depressive feelings can begin to interfere with a person's ability to work or live. When the pain is too great, insight is often sought. Help is needed. There are various kinds of treatment available, each with its own merits and drawbacks. The method used depends on the type and severity of the disorder and should be undertaken under the care of a professional. Treatment of depression by psychotherapy involves helping a person release his trapped anger and keep it from building up further. Often the therapist plays the role of a safe person the patient can be angry at without adding to his guilt. Electroshock is a physical form of therapy. It creates a partial amnesia that strengthens the defense of denial by which the depressed person has tried unsuccessfully to contain his anger. This artificially induced forgetfulness helps suppress the anger and guilt the patient has been unable to deny. It may help the patient with psychotic depression feel better momentarily, but it leaves him with less of himself to work with because of the partial memory loss. Frequently when the effects of the electroshock wear off the patient becomes depressed again. Electroshock therapy can also make it more difficult for psychotherapy to work later on because it interferes with one's ability to remember and resolve painful feelings. Like psychotherapy and electroshock, the treatment of depression with antidepressant medication is only partially effective and works with some patients and not with others. The effectiveness of antidepressant drugs is often psychological, beginning with the doctor. It gives the doctor something tangible to treat a patient with, and he thereby may tend to project a more confident attitude, which in turn may help the patient believe in him. But too many drugs are given these days. An antidepressant, imipramine, has been shown to increase the amount of anger expressed in a depressed patient's dreams, which then gradually decreases as the patient improves. This suggests that some of the improvement with this medication may be the result of depleting through dreams the pool of anger that has been fueling the patient's guilt and depression. Chlordiazepoxide, a widely used tranquilizer, seems to increase the anxiety expressed in patients' dreams, dreams that in this way apparently allow the patient to express feelings forbidden elsewhere. Generally, both doctors and patients rely too much on medicine and technology and too little on humanness and the understanding of how feelings work. In depression, as mentioned, going to the depths of your feelings and seeing your inner world as it is may allow you to make decisions you were totally incapable of making before. People recovering from depression often are able to say, I've been punished enough by my own feelings, now it's time for me to do something for myself. I know what's making me miserable and I know I can't go on living my life the way I have been. That would make me a phony, a fake. I don't want to spend the rest of my life pretending I should be happy fulfilling someone else's wishes for me. I don't want to spend the rest of my life trying to correct the uncorrectable mistakes of my past. I want to live the life that's mine. People think thoughts like this all the time but often feel too guilty to take a positive step in their own best interests. Depression can let us see that we're responsible for our own lives and must take charge of fulfilling ourselves. No one is going to do it for us. If we don't take care of ourselves first we're useless to ourselves and to others. Adolescents often feel depressed, because, as suggested earlier, their views of themselves are constantly changing and they continually suffer lapses in self-esteem. But these lapses can also become the rallying point for growth and for correcting their mistakes, for giving up artificial and childish ways of acting just to be one of the boys, or girls, at the expense of being themselves. In a way, a depression makes us all adolescents again, 
with all of the potential and opportunity for growing once more. A depression tells us there is something wrong with the way we're dealing with the world, that there is something wrong with the way we are leading our lives. The pain of depression often makes it possible for us to grow again and to give up sacrificing unnecessarily for others. Not being your best self is painful. To accept the responsibility of your own feelings and to decide to find what is best in you is the best legacy of a depression. To be your best self means that you become honest with your feelings. That you step in their own best interests. Depression can let us see that we're responsible for our own lives and must take charge of fulfilling ourselves. No one is going to do it for us. If we don't take care of ourselves first we're useless to ourselves and to others. Not being your best self is painful. To accept the responsibility of your own feelings and to decide to find what is best in you is the best legacy of a depression. To be your best self means that you become honest with your feelings. That you give up expectations of being perfect and therefore the need to conceal what you feel, because what you feel is you. Being your best self means that the unique mixture of feelings that is you is the best possible way you can be no matter what those feelings happen to be. It is best to accept a depression as proof that you are real and that you care. Accept that you are basically good even if sometimes you doubt it and, what's more, can offer evidence to back up your opinion. The problem is not that you are bad, but that you feel that you are bad and that this self-prejudice has caused you to become lost in your guilt. Take courage to grow again. Chapter 7, Getting Out of Emotional Debt and Becoming Open once you've learned to understand your feelings and to be open and honest in expressing them, you can become free of the emotional debts of your past and increasingly clear in your perception of the world. Once you're free of the need to distort and have no preconceived expectations of reality, life becomes uncomplicated. The present moment, now, seems to become elongated as you become ever more available to yourself and to the people you care about. Life becomes fuller because it's more fully experienced. Whereas once you avoided pain and shut off part of the world to contain it, now you're free to feel all your hurts and losses, settle them, and move on to the next moment in life with minimal baggage from the past. Most important, once out of emotional debt, you're into yourself, into really knowing yourself. It's easier to make decisions that are in your best interest, to shape your life so it allows you the greatest opportunity for reaching your full potential. Without honesty in the acceptance of your feelings, followed by their understanding, none of this would be possible. We all get into emotional debt from time to time. Emotional debt is a condition of imbalance in which feelings are trapped instead of expressed. Keeping feelings from being expressed naturally employs defenses and drains energy. The more feelings are held in, the less energy you have to be yourself and the less free you become. If you're in emotional debt either your feelings will eventually escape in the wrong direction or your defenses will become so rigid that you can't interact spontaneously. Getting out of emotional debt is less complicated than it sounds. We remain trapped by unexpressed feelings from our past partly because we're afraid to express those feelings, and partly because we don't understand how feelings work. If you can understand how feelings flow in response to loss, and are able to accept your anger at being hurt, you're already on the high road out of emotional debt. It's when hurt and anger aren't expressed honestly that emotional debt is piled up in the first place. The first step in getting out of emotional debt is to allow yourself to feel whatever you feel without making a value judgment. Don't try to feel, simply feel. Don't be afraid to feel because you think a particular emotion will show you in an unfavorable light. Your feelings can tell you a great deal about the world and yourself, but they shouldn't be considered evidence to prove your worth. Just because you have angry feelings doesn't make you a bad person, nor do altruistic feelings necessarily make you a good person. To get out of emotional debt you need to accept yourself, your humanness, 
including shortcomings. You need to accept the idea that imperfect as you are you're still worthwhile and that you and your feelings matter. You have to take responsibility for your feelings and learn to love yourself enough to act on them. This means that if you feel something, you need to have the courage to express it. How can you possibly grow if you don't admit to your own feelings and take responsibility for them? You can't fix feelings you don't own up to. Letting out feelings can certainly be frightening, for it's in the arena of the feelings that people tend to feel least in control and so most fearful. It's also at the point where we reject our own feelings that we erect our defenses, and if we allow them to become entrenched they put a wall between us and our feelings. When we're too distant from our feelings, then any feeling that gets through, no matter how small or ordinary, has the capacity to throw us off balance, to confuse and even immobilize. People who are massively defended against their feelings use up all of their energy just to stay intact. They dread feeling anything. It's hard enough just to get up in the morning. They tend to be more afraid of their feelings than of the events that cause them, and so they do little to resolve their problems. Instead, they waste their energies trying to convince others that they're not afraid or hurt or angry or sad. If they allowed themselves at least to begin to express their hurt or anger as they felt them, the stockpile would be reduced, as well as the accompanying defensiveness and stress. People burdened with withheld emotions are usually under continual stress, covering up as they are for something they think is unacceptable. Their emotional life is so guarded they don't see the world as it is. They think it's the world outside that's got them so tense and nervous, when actually the trouble originates within, where, so long as it stays unacknowledged, it also remains unrelieved. To get out of emotional debt you need to believe in either you nor the world will come unstuck if you give expression to your feelings, expressing feelings appropriately rarely leads to losing control. Getting angry and crying, for example, is not being out of control but merely expressing intense feelings. Some people don't think it's nice to have such strong feelings. Such a notion of what's nice is itself stifling. The very fear of losing control often can result from denying the urge to let out feelings. The trapped feelings only build up to trip off arguments, explosions, and magnify hurts out of proportion. And all of this tends to give the inhibited person the impression he's out of control which in a way, he is. The sensation of any feelings being expressed comes as a surprise and tends to unnerve him. Getting out of emotional debt and staying open, they're the objectives for all of us who want to free ourselves from the crippling burden of unreal expectations born in our past. No matter how terrible your past life has been or how rigid your upbringing, there's plenty of basis to hope for growth if you can learn to accept your feelings and stop apologizing for them. If you can't even be free to feel what you feel, you're in bondage regardless of the freedom of the society you live in. Whoever finds you unacceptable because you express them is a person who doesn't want you to be real, you can probably do without them. The happy consequence of getting free of burdensome emotions is to become open. To be open you need to understand what you feel, know where the feeling comes from, and be able to express that feeling to whomever is appropriate. In solving problems you can now rely on your feelings to indicate the right direction. The intellect and its tool, logic, can be led astray. They need the active collaboration of your feelings to keep them from altering reality to suit false needs. Feelings tell the truth. When you are open, needs still exist, but you can perceive them clearly because you are open to your feelings that define and interpret them. Being open is to be in continuous contact with the world around you through your feelings. You are continually rising to a higher, unencumbered level of perceiving the world, with a view that is less and less defensive. As you become open you depend less on what others say and more on your own sense of the world on what your feelings say. When you are open you're less anxious. You need only to stop and ask, what am I afraid of losing? 
What is threatening me now? How may I be hurt? Am I in some sort of danger? Am I afraid of accepting some part of myself? Am I afraid of assuming responsibility for doing something that hurt another person? Am I afraid of taking and handling blame for some act or word because of the feeling of guilt? As you ask, with an understanding of the relevant feelings and how they operate, and free of the weight of emotional debt, you can answer your questions near automatically to resolve your anxiety, the more frequently asked, the more easily and automatically answered. If you exercise your muscles they're toned and behave more efficiently for you. If you train your mind on hard problems you make it a more efficient tool as well. In similar fashion, if your feelings are operating freely your emotional health, well-being and personal development have got to respond to this openness. That voice of your inner feelings speaks for the you that has the greatest chance of making a success of your life with the least wasted effort. You don't need to create this person because you already are this person. It's only your defenses that stand in the way of expressing this higher self in you. Once expressed, it can be refined and shaped further, but it's there or it isn't from the start. There are no great mysteries in life really, just doors to open to explore each step in your growth. Each new step is taken with a little pain. Just as it takes some energy to block an emotion, so it takes energy to free one. Even if you know what's blocking your progress, you can't grow until you give up the defenses that are holding you in place. Giving up defenses allows you to see yourself as you are. This can be frightening, but it's necessary if you really want to move on to the next step. Each step is taken by experiencing openly and honestly the feelings that have previously been concealed. The way to discovering the truth begins with being honest with your feelings. To be honest means to state the highest truth as you see it without apology or defense, without pretense or selectivity. To bombard other people with painful revelations about themselves may be telling the truth, but only a selected part of it. The greater truth may be that you are merely being hurtful out of a sense of anger that you may not be expressing appropriately. The highest honesty is seeking beyond your own distortions without illusions. Feelings without honesty are defenses. The world without honesty is an illusion. Memory without honesty is only a fantasy. Time without honesty can never be now. Space without honesty can never be here. Love without honesty is possessiveness. Without honesty there is no real growth. Without honesty there is no freedom. Without honesty there is no hope. Without honesty nothing is real. Without honesty nothing is. When people become honest they can begin to experience the same reality. When two people share the same reality they not only validate their individual lives but life itself. With honesty not only our sense of reality grows but so does our strength and self-acceptance, reinforced by others who are on the same journey. The journey begins the same way for all of us, by asking ourselves with as much honesty as possible, along with new understanding, what do I feel? Where is that feeling coming from? Is it familiar? In what way? When did it occur before? What event is linked to it? Is that event a threat of a loss, an actual loss, or a hurt, or some other feeling? You know now that the feeling of anxiety will usually be attached to the threat of a loss, that sometimes just remembering an old loss can recreate the original anxiety. Usually this means you haven't yet completely accepted the loss and that your anxiety can't be settled until the loss is totally accepted and your grief is allowed to surface. You also know that if the event recalled involves hurt, the blocked feeling is almost always anger. Allowing the anger out is the way to clear the persistent feeling of hurt. And if the painful event involves much anger there is likely to be recollections both of hurt and guilt over the anger. Again, the way to clear these feelings is to accept the loss and hurt, 
and to express the anger. There's no mystique to this method. Any sentient, normal person can use it, and intelligence quotient is not the determining factor, indeed, if it were the majority of us would be in considerable difficulty. How often have you or a friend sat down to figure out a problem and come up empty, blank? Still as uncomfortable as before? It's only when our feelings, our sixth sense, are allowed play, and when we are able to pay meaningful attention to them, that the discomfort diminishes and we're able to go about our lives with renewed efficiency and pleasure. When we're emotionally uncomfortable we're least likely to function at our best, regardless of our intelligence. None of this, of course, is to suggest a kind of anti-intellectual mindlessness. It is to re-emphasize that thinking a problem through without feeling it through is to reach at best a partial, temporary and superficial solution. It's a matter of what works. As you become open, you also become much more aware of your so-called intuition. You can sense more about other people because you can receive what comes from them to you without distorting it with your defenses. See for yourself how this can work by trying the following exercise. Sit quietly for five minutes alone in a room with your eyes closed and clear your mind of previous images and thoughts. Let it go blank. Concentrate on the images behind your eyes. Arrange to have a second person enter the room without speaking. Open your eyes. You will experience a sense of the other person perceiving his presence as a subtle change in your feelings. Such a perception occurs every time two people meet, whether or not they notice it. It results from the interaction of the energies of the two people each with its own particular force and quality. You may notice a vague sense of warmth or coldness, of power or vulnerability. The change you perceive is the emotional aura of the other person. It varies and changes in a person just as his feelings do. A person's aura tells something important about him. There's nothing especially new about this phenomenon. Everybody has, for example, felt threatened at some point by the mere presence of a menacing person, even when he says nothing. There's nothing especially mystical in this. We're talking about the equipment that's within every human being. It doesn't depend on occult training to perceive it. It depends on you, developing toward your fullest potential as a feeling and therefore knowing person. If you practice sensing this way, you can learn to develop your perception and intuition to a high degree of consciousness. When you learn to sense things in others, you will also learn to sense more in yourself. Feelings you were formerly unaware of are lowered. Once you learn to be at this place where intellect and feelings meet, you can enjoy the constant interplay of the two. It becomes easier for you to tell what is real. Your skill at this, as at any other art, improves and sharpens with practice. When you learn to sense in this way, you will be in touch with a new source of wisdom, the truth of your own experience, which is now made available to you. You become a reliable instrument by which to measure the input from the outside world. When something makes you feel uncertain, you're probably right to feel so and need only say, I'm not sure and ask somebody for an explanation or for further time to consider whatever the situation or statement is. If what somebody says sounds to you like an excuse, a defense, or doesn't feel real or honest, say so and say it directly. If another person is pressuring you into something, tell him so. You'll likely get a good or at least a real response from him because your interpretation of his behavior is accurate and he'll know it, whether he wants to admit it or not. You give him feedback, let him know realistically the effect of his behavior on you and open the way for a dialogue, beginning with your asking questions about why he's pressuring you, why he won't let you go at your own pace, a perception you've managed because you are open to his feelings and to yours. You don't need to prove what you feel, you only need to know what you feel and to communicate it. It's almost always self-defeating to conceal the truth of what you experience from yourself. 
A person who thinks there are things he shouldn't talk about or feel would do well to re-examine why he is so guarded. People are supposed to talk about feelings. It's bad enough to have a conversation with somebody who can't or won't let through what he feels about you. If you're both in the avoidance business, the exchange becomes artificial and stilted. You might as well punch it out on a computer card. The trouble is, these unspoken feelings generally surface in some form at some other and less appropriate time anyway, causing great mischief, confusion and probably further defensiveness. When you're open your feelings direct and inform your mental process. They quickly alert you to a situation that doesn't feel right. It's then that you need to slow down and ask, what's wrong here? If possible, it's helpful to share your reaction with somebody else. You're not perfect or infallible, but if you've managed through understanding to become open you've got a very reasonable basis for believing more often than not that your view is a clear one. When you're open and alert each person, each impression makes its full and unique impact on your experience and consciousness. If you have learned how feelings work, you'll be able to understand and handle the behavior of others, whether, for example, they're hurting you out of anger, or trying to make you believe you hurt them so they can avoid their own feeling of guilt. Being open also means your sexual energy is freely available to you. For the average person this is surely vital, most of us can't exist at the exalted level of sex sublimated in great works that has been ascribed to some great artists. The problems that get in the way of expressing and enjoying sexuality are rarely specifically sexual, they're all the problems with expressing feelings that have already been discussed. If you feel good about yourself as a person, if you're open and free with your feelings, you should have little difficulty enjoying a full sexual life. Problems in technique are generally minor. Few things improve your sexual performance and ability to enjoy sex as much as improving the way you feel about yourself. This book has tried to help you answer some fundamental questions in your life. Who are you? How did you get that way? Where are you going? The road to each person's highest self is paved by feelings honestly perceived and straightforwardly expressed. Each of us must try to create the best life we can imagine for ourselves by tying together the most promising pieces of our past with our best sense of our present and future. Only you know your dream for yourself. Only you can make it happen. Only you know the person inside you. Your goal is to let him or her out. To get to that goal you will have to become as open and honest about your feelings as you possibly can, letting them flow, taking responsibility for them, for your life, they are the best, most direct way to discovering the true and real person inside you. Along the way you will find yourself becoming free of emotional debt to the past. You will be able to be yourself without exaggeration or apology. You will, in the best sense, have arrived. Afterward. A person who does not understand the feelings beneath his actions doesn't really understand himself at all. He spends his life trapped in a world full of dark comers where silent forces out of his control influence his actions and direct him. Our feelings define reality for us more directly and more completely than anything else. Our feelings define time for us, a loss in the future is perceived as fear. A loss in the present is felt as pain. A loss in the past is experienced as anger. Our feelings center the world and make it accessible to us. Without feelings the world is remote. Life should be lived in the present, for it is only in the present that we're able to exert any control over our lives. We can't change our past and the future is continually formed in the present. We need to learn to invest our energy in the present, where it will do the most good. If we take care of the present honestly and without pretense or apology, the future will take care of itself. All the creations of man's genius and acts of compassion over the centuries, while pointing to his promise, don't change the fact that he's forever stuck with a finite mind in an infinite system. His highest sense, his creative sense, 
while it may have provided him with some intimation of immortality by allowing him to create things that outlive him, seems to have offered him little in finding a way to bridge the gap between his intellectual limitations and the infinite forces working on him. Perhaps this gap can never be closed. Perhaps no one can ever really comprehend the cosmos or understand why we were made aware of our journey through it. Nonetheless, we're alive because we feel life, and ought to take care to preserve what gifts we've been allowed. If we can't comprehend the greater world, we can focus our attention on the world within, the world of feelings, and establish an order and understanding there. If we can feel and be ourselves and permit our feelings to flow where they seemed naturally inclined, we will find ourselves better people, by being the best of ourselves. Perhaps this, after all, is the best we can aspire to, to be our best selves. In the freedom of being our best we can allow other people to be whatever they are. We assume responsibility for our lives and act on our feelings, doing what feels right to us, making the important decisions in our lives in our own enlightened self-interest. It is only after we each ensure our own survival that we can freely help others in a way not determined by our own needs. Greed is seldom seen in people who have fulfilled themselves. To be rich is to need nothing. It is impossible to acquire everything, though some people still vainly try, but sadly too few people are willing to take the risk of becoming their best selves, to discover who they really are and use their feelings as their best guide in that search. Each of us has the right to take his own life seriously and to discover what it was that he was designed by nature to do. If everyone followed the suggestions of his inner voice, his world would change very much for the better. So, I suspect, would the world outside. If we each used our feelings as a guide to reach the path for becoming our highest selves, we would at least be on the way to finding fulfillment in our own life, and the greater world would begin to make sense. A person who is not comprehensible to himself cannot expect to experience a world that makes much sense. If each person followed his feelings, he would find the direction he is really looking for, without dogma, cult, government or guru. The light you are seeking is inside. The light is life, is love, is you. Find it, nurture it, share it. To seek it is to take part in the infinite.